Hi, I'm Ms. Schaefer, and welcome to my AP Psychology class. We're going to talk a little bit about research methods in psychology today. So, today's goal is really to think about how psychologists learn about the mental processes and behaviors that we're going to be talking about in this class in a way that is concrete. Well, we use research methods, just like any other science. So today we're going to try and understand and evaluate the different types of designs for psychological studies. So, there are going to be two main categories that we talk about today. It's experimental and non-experimental. Our non-experimental can be broken down a little bit further depending on what we're trying to do. With descriptive research, we're just going to describe the characteristics or behaviors that we are witnessing. A lot of times this is done in case studies, um, surveys, or naturalistic observations. We're just describing what we're seeing with the information that's presented to us. With correlational, we're going to try to use the data that we collect in order to draw relationships between two variables. But nothing is being controlled in these non-experimental uh, research methods. If we start controlling things, trying to manipulate things, then we are going to have an experiment on our hands. And this is going to allow us to determine if there's a causal relationship between variables. So. When we're doing research, we are going to collect a few different types of data. There's two broad categories that we'll have, and you need to know the difference between the two. So for qualitative, we are getting descriptions of the qualities through a sort of narrative description of what was seen or how a conversation went in an interview. So a lot of uh, observation notes and interview transcripts are going to fall under the qualitative category. They can be a little harder to compare to each other, so a lot of times researchers like to have quantitative, which is specific numerical data that can easily be compared. It's often good to have a bit of a mix of the two. So when it comes to quantitative data, uh, it can be anything that is measured specifically in units, so this can work really well when we're talking about hormone levels, things like that. It can also work really well for things that have a clear-cut score, like IQ tests. If you have a clear-cut IQ score, those can be easier to compare to each other. Um, you can also have counts of number of symptoms witnessed, number of symptoms reported, or even use something like a Likert scale to collect information about sentiments or agreement, where we have sort of this typical five-point scale with about half positive, half negative, and that one neutral middle ground, and that allows us to uh, quantify things that are often more qualitative when we think about it. So, now in order to collect data, a lot of times people are going to use a survey. This is a method where we collect self-reported attitudes, behaviors, from hopefully a representative and random sample of a population. This is a tool that we'll use in descriptive research as well as potentially correlational where we collect a variety of variables and try to relate them and even in experimental research. So surveys are not necessarily their own research method, but they are used in research a lot. There are some pretty big strengths to a survey. Uh, they are very efficient and often super affordable to collect a large amount of data. Right. When it comes to a survey, a lot of times we can just send it out to a good portion of a like, campus. If we're trying to study people here at Round Rock High School, right, we could easily send it to every third student and it would make it to them and that would be a very easy thing for us to do, especially using something like Google Forms. So, great way to collect a lot of data. However, there are some weaknesses. One, trying to actually get that representative sample can be difficult. Some people may not want to respond to it, right? Sometimes it may be difficult to access certain populations to be able to get information from them. We can also have issues with wording of the questions. It can skew how participants respond. The order of the questions, the specific wording, if a scale is unclear, people may respond differently every time, and that leads to a less valid result from our survey. Also, when people are self-reporting information, they may not always be the most accurate. Think about, have you ever lied on a survey or just kind of click through? Right. 
Some people are going to lie because of social desirability bias. It's something that we've seen in human behavior, where people want to present themselves in a manner that will be viewed favorably. So if there's some sort of embarrassing behavior, like bedwetting, or maybe they feel embarrassed about reporting failing a class, they may not report those behaviors. So things to keep in mind when giving a survey. Now this is just a tool for data collection. We're really going to get into these uh, research methods as our big ones for the course. So as we go along, think about what are the strengths and weaknesses of each method and add them to your notes as you go along. So starting with naturalistic observation, uh, this is going to be observing people and recording the behavior witnessed in the natural environment. So where they typically are, there's no manipulation and no control. So this can be done simply watching children play on a playground at school. Uh, we may even see industrial organizational psychologists just observing worker productivity in their office setting. That way we're seeing what's going on in the actual environment that they're in. So there can be laboratory observations, but then we're changing the environment and the results may not have that ecological validity. Some big strengths of the Naturalistic observation is it does show us real world behavior and researchers may witness things that they didn't predict would happen. Right? We can actually see what is really going on that we may not have thought about. However, there are some weaknesses. In a naturalistic observation, the researcher has no control over any of the variables at play. So if something changes in the environment, right, we don't know if that's going to have a big effect on behavior. So sometimes it takes a long period of witnessing uh, people in their natural environment to be able to try and see what is truly consistent behavior. There's also the problem of observer bias. When the researcher is observing, they can describe their observations inaccurately. They may be too focused on something or interpret it the wrong way uh, or tune something else out. And it may lead to them confirming their previous beliefs because that's what they're focused on. We also have the Hawthorne effect, which is something that can happen to our participants. When people know that they are being observed, they can act differently. Have you ever done that when a principal's come in to watch your teacher in the classroom? It happens. And we can't just not tell people that they're part of a study because researchers are ethically required to notify participants that they're part of a study. So, our next one is going to be some case studies. All right, so these are descriptive techniques where we're really going in depth into a single individual or a group in hope that we can reveal some universal principles. Uh, so these can happen with some severe brain uh, surgery. So patient HM had part of his temporal lobe and hippocampus removed and it resulted in some memory deficits. This isn't something that we're just going to go around doing to other people, but since he had it for medical reasons, uh, it is going to be something that we want to look into to see if this happened to other people, what does removing these parts of the brain do? All right, another one, uh, accidents. Phineas Gage had a railroad spike go through his head, damaging large parts of his frontal lobe, and we want to see what happens when these parts of the brain are damaged. It's really helpful. Um, we can also use it for rare disorders like synesthesia, um, which is a really rare disorder and if we want to understand it better it's going to be really hard for us to collect a lot of data from a large amount of people because it is rare so using a case study allows us to go in depth and learn more about these things so they can be about more than just an individual um, we can see these about like twins if we're doing a lot of in-depth data doing interviews observations surveys iq tests right they can tell us uh, a lot more about a case and hopefully we can generalize it to a broader population. It can even be done with like a singular class or a whole school. So if you've ever been part of a pilot program, it's sort of a case study for a course. Now, this is great because it does collect in-depth detailed data, especially about rare unique situations. However, because we're usually not studying very many people at all, it may not be generalizable to the broader population. So we have to keep that in mind when doing a case study. And since there is often a lot of interviews, observations going on, there's potential for researcher bias in what gets reported and collected. 
Now we're moving into experiments. So this is where we're getting a little bit different. Uh, this is where we're starting to manipulate variables in a controlled environment. And the whole goal is to observe if there's any sort of cause or effect relationship. So in order to truly determine if there is cause and effect, we not only want to randomly sample like we did before in a, the use of a survey, but we want to randomly assign them so we can control over other relevant variables. So researchers are going to test the um, effects of a variety of different things from sleep deprivation to the use of a drug on how it impacts human behavior in things like experiments. Now, this is great because it is the only research method that can prove causation uh, because it is in a controlled setting. Now, the results may be a little bit different in other settings, so we do have to keep that in mind that in the real world, we don't have a fully controlled environment, so things may be a little bit different in practice. These can be very expensive and difficult to run when you're trying to control a whole environment and eliminate all other variables. Um, it, it can add up, and if research is not fully funded, uh, it can be less achievable to conduct experiments. And there are some limits. Due to ethics, we cannot harm our participants, and we do need to let them know that they are parts of studies. Um, so there are some things that are going to be a little bit harder to do experiments on, right? We don't want to do any harm to participants. So if we have something that is a little more ethically questionable, but we really want to gather some information, we may do something called a quasi-experiment. This is where we're going to have manipulated factors of variables um, in a controlled setting, but we didn't do any random assignment to the control or experimental groups. Now, why would we do this? What are some things that we might want to study that could be harmful to participants? Well, some examples are things like teratogens in pregnancy. So if we have women who have been exposed to teratogens, which could be things like drugs um, or an illness, and we want to understand the effect of that on pregnancy and prenatal development, uh, we're not going to purposefully expose people to these harmful things because we know they could have a negative impact. However, if we know they've been exposed, be good for us to gather information about what happens in those cases. So we are having the change in variables. However, we are not purposefully randomly assigning people to the situations. Right? Another great example would be something like smoking and lung health, right? or smoking and cognitive ability. If we think there's a negative impact, it's not very ethical for us to do because we need to do no harm. So instead, we can find people who have already been smoking and then measure that against people who don't smoke. People have already chosen uh, sort of which group they're going to be in, so there may be other variables at play. So it's not always the best in telling us about what the true causation is. It doesn't rule out third variables. But again, providing really useful information about things that uh, we can't really study otherwise ethically. It allows us to have a larger sample than a case study to be able to learn more about these different situations. So, lastly, we're going to look at a correlation. So correlation, or second to last, correlation is a measure um, between the or a measure of how two variables change together. It's not really cause and effect, it's just how well one predicts the other. So this is something like linking sleep time to higher anxiety levels or linking having more books in a house to increased SAT score. There could be a causal relationship between these, but we won't definitively know unless we run an experiment. So correlations are a good place to start to gather information to determine an experiment you may want to do. Correlations are based off of real world behavior, um, so they have a little more ecological validity because it's not necessarily in a controlled environment. And we can see unexpected patterns of behavior as we're collecting data through methods like survey observation. And again, it does not prove causation, right? Sometimes there are third variables at play uh, that are really the cause between things. And we can have illusory correlations where the numbers just happen to change together at the same time, but there's not actually a real relationship. Something that can happen is if we're expecting a relationship to be there, when we believe it's going to be there, we're more likely to pay attention 
to little changes and recall those things, and it will confirm our beliefs and in instances of confirmation bias. So we have to be careful with correlations. Now, in correlational research, we're going to go a little more in depth.